Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first Embark ERS Lessons in Bronchiectasis webinar. My name is Michal Steinberg. I'm a pulmonologist from Haifa, Israel, with an interest in bronchiectasis and adult CF. This webinar series is put to by Embark, the European Bronchiectasis Collaboration, and is intended for everyone interested to learn more about bronchiectasis. Today's topic is the etiologic workup of bronchiectasis, which tests for which patients, and it will be presented by Dr. Mattia Negro with Professor Stefano Alberti as the discussant. They're both from Humanitas University in Milan, Italy. <clears throat> and before I hand over, I have some housekeeping notes. The first is to please be interactive. Use the chat option to um, place questions and comments. Um, and please you, mute your microphone and uh, camera unless you want to speak. Use the raise hand option if you wish to do so, and we'll call the name that appears on your participant screen. So make sure it's the right name. We have translations um, available. I'll just share a slide uh, with this. Um, so just a second. And uh, this slide will show you uh, how to activate uh, the translation if you do so, if you want to do so. So um, it's in the um, show captions. You have to uh, choose the um, English, choose English as the speaking language and select the target, target language that you want. Um, if you uh, do use the uh, translations, please let us know uh, how in a, in a, and send us your feedback, how it went and uh, indicate the language that you had. So with that, I will uh, hand over to Professor Stefano Aliberti uh, to present um, the topic and our speaker, please. Thank you very much and uh, uh, welcome uh, to our uh, increasing number of participants, as I can see from the webinar. Uh, thank you for connecting. Thank you for uh, the uh, colleagues who organized this interesting, uh, I hope this interesting webinar. Uh, my name is, uh, is Stefano Liberti. I'm a pulmonologist uh, based in Milan and uh, together with uh, Dr. Mattia Nigro, uh, who is a fellow from uh, uh, my university, Humanitas University in Milan. Um, we will uh, uh, discuss a little bit uh, about uh, etiological uh, uh, testing uh, in uh, adults uh, with uh, non cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis. It's very important for me to clarify that uh, we're going to target uh, the, pop the uh, adult population. Uh, and uh, um, I think we are ready uh, for to share the slides and uh, uh, start uh, our meeting. Yeah, the sharing doesn't seem to work by now. So, so Mattia, uh, Mattia, you're working to share the slides, right? Yeah, but the... Zoom told me that uh, the uh, organizer needs to uh, enable me for the sharing of the of the display. Yeah, you should be host of this meeting. I can by now. Very good. Yeah, good. So very good. Okay. So here you can find our uh, email address, uh, our uh, Twitter account. In case uh, uh, you might have any any question, please um, feel free to uh, write uh, either to myself or to Dr. Negro, and we will be happy to uh, follow up our our presentation. Uh, so. Uh, just to give a general overview on bronchiectasis, because this is the first uh, uh, lecture of the webinar, uh, we are talking about a chronic uh, respiratory disease uh, characterized by a permanent uh, dilatation of the bronchi, as you can see from the image. Uh, from uh, an histopathological point of view, inflammation uh, is uh, a, a feature of the disease, usually neutrophilic, uh, or, but we have learned that we might have also mixed inflammation or even eosinophilic inflammation. 
Since uh, several uh, years ago, uh, we were doing a bronchography to make a diagnosis of bronchiectasis, but nowadays we know that high resolution CT scan is the gold standard for the uh, radiological diagnosis of this disease. Now, uh, in terms of epidemiology, uh, these are uh, the most solid data to me, uh, uh, coming from the UK Clinical Practice Research Data Link, uh, showing uh, uh, that bronchiectasis has a prevalence uh, around 566 in uh, uh, women and 585 in men, uh, over uh, 100,000 people. As you can see, the uh, there was an increase uh, in incidence and prevalence of bronchiectasis uh, since the beginning of 2000. And uh, as you can see on the right part of the slide, uh, you, uh, we have an increase in uh, prevalence, especially in elderly and very elderly people. Now, to give a, a general overview of the bronchiectasis management uh, after the diagnosis on high resolution CT scan, uh, international guidelines are asking us to identify potentially treatable causes. And this is the topic we are going to talk about today, uh, to do a lung function evaluation, to uh, look for the presence of specific uh, microorganisms uh, in the lung of our patients. Comorbidities assessment uh, uh, in the early stage of the evaluation, then a severity assessment and the identification of uh, clinical phenotypes. And then in terms of intervention, we recognize uh, uh, five important pillars, like uh, the elimination of the uh, etiology, improvement of uh, uh, airway clearance, control the infection, control lung function, manage complication through different approaches, uh, together with the patient in a self-management program, with the final goal of improving patient's quality of life, decreasing exacerbations, decreasing hospitalizations and decreasing mortality because we should be aware that bronchiectasis has an attributable mortality. These slides is color uh, with different colors representing the different healthcare professionals that are involved uh, through a multidisciplinary uh, team in the uh, management of the disease. And uh, uh, together with Dr. Negro, uh, we will explore our the multidisciplinary approach is also important for the etiological evaluation of bronchiectasis. Uh, now I will uh, give you, Mattia, uh, the, the stage to uh, introduce uh, the, uh, the topic of today. Thank you. So thank you, Professor Aliberti, for your kind introduction. Um, and today we're going to talk about etiology of bronchiectasis, as you were mentioning. And let's start with the pathogenesis of bronchiectasis that is nowadays not fully understood. Uh, since the 80s, we know that the, the vicious cycle model is something that uh, uh, describes the pathogenesis of bronchiectasis. So uh, ciliary dysfunction, inflammation, mainly neutrophilic, uh, chronic bacterial infection, and lung destruction contribute to the pathogenesis of the disease. Uh, this model has recently been updated into the vicious vortex, that is uh, uh, the new model, uh, that uh, emphasizes even more the interrelationship between different components and the highlights that uh, each patient can uh, um, start the vicious vortex from a different point. Um, and we should think about, we should think the etiologists uh, are the actually entry gates uh, in the vicious vortex. And uh, a given patient might actually uh, begin the vicious vortex from uh, um, a different point. Uh, so in case we got a patient with a CFTR dysfunction or primary ciliary dyskinesia, we can think that uh, the primary um, etiological diagnosis, the primary uh, failure is a ciliary dysfunction. Uh, in some other cases like inflammatory bowel disease or connective tissue disease or alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, rheumatoid arthritis, or allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, uh, inflammation is, uh, is the key here. Uh, in some other cases, like uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria, pulmonary disease, uh, or immunodeficiencies, uh, infections are actually um, the, the first element. Uh, and uh, with aspiration, post-infectious bronchiectasis, chemotherapy, COPD, or post-obstructive bronchiectasis, uh, the lung destruction comes first. Uh, so, 
we got lots of, of different etiology here. And a possible question would be, uh, why is etiology important in the management of bronchiectasis patients? Uh, there are several reasons. The first of which is probably uh, because uh, in some cases, bronchiectasis can be the manifestation of an underlying disease that can be either systemic or genetic or rare. Uh, then we should we should state that some etiologies are treatable. So treaty, treating some of this etiology uh, with a proper management uh, can improve the condition of our patient in terms of quality of life, exacerbation, and even mortality in some cases. Uh, and that uh, access to a specific program is something that uh, you want to consider mm -hmm. for a patient mm -hmm. with uh, mm -hmm. uh, specific, specific uh, uh, etiologies with the possibility of uh, drug prescription and trials enrollments, and most importantly, because patients want to know what their etiology is. So uh, we know that uh, in the room, there are lots of different uh, people dealing with bronchiectasis, uh, mainly clinicians, but not only clinicians. And uh, among the clinicians, we got people working in different settings, uh, ranging from primary care to uh, pulmonology department uh, and uh, general pulmonology clinics uh, and uh, uh, expert in bronchiectasis as well. So we've decided to uh, face the, um, the topic that is the etiological workup uh, according to the different site of care uh, that you might find. Uh, so the site of care are the three I've previously mentioned that are um, primary care, general respiratory clinic, and dedicated bronchiectasis program. Uh, and uh, we could consider that uh, in this, in this uh, escalation, there is a different possibility of a multidisciplinary management and a different possibility, a different um, amount of available resources, but uh, the intensity of, work, of the workup should not be limited by the settings in which you're working, uh, but should be focused on the specific features of the patient, as we'll see in a moment. So we've prepared some clinical case for uh, each one of this category, uh, and we got different polls uh, uh, to be interactive with you. So don't be shy with the following clinical case. And let's start with the clinical case number one. Uh, there is a clinical case that you can possibly face uh, during uh, in your in a primary care setting. Uh, we're talking about a 44 years old male, uh, former smoker with 10 packs year history, uh, a BMI of 27, diagnosed with mild asthma, treated only occasionally with uh, an ICS lab accumulation. Uh, no daily silent symptoms here, uh, just one episode of acute bronchitis in the last year treated with uh, antibiotics and hemophilus influenza isolated in the sputum during the acute phase. Uh, his chest X-ray is negative, and I'm going to show you a CT scan, uh, starting from top. Okay. You can see some bronchial dilatation, some bronchial wall thickness here, uh, and probably even some mild mucus plug. So the question I got for you is, would you perform any etiological screening test in this patient in a primary care setting? Uh, please answer with a yes or a no. Only one choice allowed. So Professor Alberti, what do you think about this clinical case? Yes, actually, uh... <laughs> Actually, um, this is a this is a mild one, uh, but uh, still, uh, for those who are um, who are into bronchiectasis, actually, uh, our eyes can see some dilatation. the the pro The point is, if this is radiologically significant, this is clinically significant, which kind of test we should do? Uh, what's the rule of the uh, that um, H flu? Uh, so the uh, I I mean. I'm expecting not a, a unanimous answer, right, uh, Mattia? Uh, we will uh, we will see in a bit, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I think uh, we can probably close the poll by now, and we can see the results. Okay, that's interesting. Let's see the the results. So I don't know if you can see this, but I got the results by now, and I can say that seven. Yep. Okay. You have the results, Mattia? I, I, I can't see the, those. Okay, 72% of people would have performed the etiological screening test in these patients. So, oh. if you want, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, this is interesting. So one third of, uh, of our colleagues uh, would not uh, uh, go for an etiological screening and uh, two thirds uh, will do 
uh, at least one test uh, to investigate the etiology. So I think they recognize the disease as a radiological significant uh, and they'll go for that. Actually, uh, Mattia, what, uh, what are what literature uh, tells us about that? So uh, there's no solid evidence on this topic because uh, the guide, the international guidelines that we usually follow uh, in the clinical practice for the management of patients with bronchiectasis, that are the uh, ERI, ERS 2017 guidelines and the 2019 BTS guidelines, don't face this topic because both of them are only addressed to the management of patients with clinically relevant bronchiectasis. So none of them address the uh, topic on uh, the screening of patients with uh, radiologically significant bronchiectasis without, uh, a, a clinical, without a clinical uh, disease. So the difference, the difference, the uh, definition of bronchiectasis as a chronic respiratory disease just came out like one year and a half ago uh, with this paper uh, that uh, established that to have a, a bronchiectasis respiratory disease, you should have at least two different features. The first one being the uh, clinical syndrome uh, requiring at least two among cough most days a week, sputum production most days a week, and a history of pulmonary exacerbation. On the other hand, if you, if you have this, you can consider to have clinically relevant bronchiectasis, that is the blue box at the bottom on the right on the right hand side, but to have a clinically and radiologically relevant bronchiectasis, you should have radiolo radiological findings. So the other thing you, you need is to have uh, uh, the radiological appearance of dilated airways uh, in at a chest HRCT scan. Uh, in case you have both, you can talk about uh, radiological and clinically relevant bronchiectasis. But probably in the case of our patient, we're in this window here, uh, where the patient has some radiological evidence of bronchiectasis without clinically disease, clinically relevant disease. And in this case, actually, the guidelines don't help us. Uh, the management of this patient is unknown at the moment. Uh, but probably in my experience, uh, you can confirm this if you want, um, we, will, we will not consider screening this patient unless he develops a clinically relevant disease. What do you think? No, I agree. I agree. Um, the, I agree. I would, uh, I would follow up closely this patient because he's a young patient uh, that might have uh, some bronchiectasis on a CT scan. Uh, I would probably understood better the rule of hemophilus. And uh, if the patient uh, will become uh, clinically significant, uh, then uh, uh, I might be more uh, aggressive in the in the workup and uh, will uh, will try to manage uh, these patients. Uh, um, uh, I mean, better also from the etiological point of view. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Uh... Going through clinical case number two, we're talking about a different, a different case here evaluated in the primary care setting. Uh, it's a 64 years old male, a former mild smoker with a history of 10 packs here and a BMI of 23 uh, that uh, reported to have a, a gastroesophageal reflux and arterial hypertension as a main comorbidities. Uh, this time we got a clinically significant disease because the patient has daily sputum, 20 ml per day uh, with a marrow of three, uh, calf most days a week and four episodes of exacerbation during the last year treated with uh, antimicrobial therapy. Uh, no chronic infection reported. And you can see his CT scan here with uh, uh, some dilated airways, bronchial wall thickness, probably some mucus plug here. I'm not sure about this one. Uh, but this is certainly a clinically and radiologically relevant bronchiectasis. So the question I got for you all in this case is, which diagnostic test would you perform for these patients? So we've provided lots of options here. You can choose one or more than one if you, if you want. Uh, the options are sweat test, IgG subclasses uh, plus lymphocyte subpopulation, uh, complete blood cell count, sputum culture with or without bronchoscopy and BAL, uh, autoantibodies, IgG before and after pneumococcal vaccination, ABPA testing, serum alpha-1 antitrypsin, nasal brushing and microscopy for cilia evaluation, and uh, serum IgG, IgA, and IgM. So please launch the poll. Okay. So while people are voting, um... You may want to um, just remind people of what the Murray uh, sputum color chart is and, and uh, how it's useful in, in evaluation of bronchiectasis. 
Yeah, so I can I can take this. Uh, so Mattia, you can follow up uh, the the poll. Uh, so the Murray uh, scale uh, um, is a is a, a color scale uh, of the sputum. Uh, uh, we've been derived uh, by Murray. Um, uh, she was uh, she was I think a PhD at that time in 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 Scotland uh, that uh, can uh, help us to stratify uh, the sputum of our bronchiectasis patients into uh, three category. Uh, if uh, the patient uh, um, it's a it's a eight color uh, scale. Um, uh, scale uh, uh, tool, uh, and uh, um, you can find this on the on the Google and on the different website. Uh, it's very useful uh, because it's been correlated with uh, different data of uh, infl inflammation and microbiology of our patients. Um, actually, I use this scale every day. Uh, and I ask my patients either to show me the sputum in the clinic uh, and I will by myself compare the color with the scale or the patient can point uh, the, the color uh, directly in the screen. And uh, it's very useful to identify uh, the severity uh, during stable state and microbiology during stable state and the evolution uh, during exacerbation. So I would strongly suggest you guys to uh, use that, uh, that scale. Yeah, and we have a, a question in the chat um, about the, the first case of the very mild uh, um, radiological bronchiectasis. Is his history of asthma relevant? Uh, do you think his, his history of asthma is relevant in the previous case? So just very briefly bef uh, uh, before we see the poll of uh, case number two. Yes, I think so, uh, Michal. I think so. I mean, uh, uh, we should better evaluate uh, the uh, possible coexistence of asthma, the, the, the coexistence of asthma in these patients, or maybe the other way around, the possible coexistence of a, another chronic respiratory disease we call bronchiectasis in a patient with asthma, especially because of the isolation of hemophilus. Uh, but the, uh, the comment is very well made. Uh, and uh, I agree uh, that uh, a better evaluation of that uh, radiological images in the context of asthma uh, should be done in that patient. Okay, let's see the results of the poll. Okay, so 87% of people would have performed the sputum culture and the bronchoscopy plus valve. Then following, we got 70% of people that would have asked the complete blood cell count. And then we got serum IgG and IgM with a 66%. Uh, and then ABPA testing is following just above 50%. Uh, and then IgG subclasses are 42. So I think these are the main findings of our poll. Yeah. What do you think? Yes, actually, the three most common are uh, sputum culture. Mm -hmm. uh, that actually could be interesting uh, because there might be some pathogens that are not only giving chronic infection, but uh, they might be also uh, an etiology of a disease progression, right? Or for some patients also an etiology of bronchiectasis. Uh, I'm thinking about non-tuberculous mycobacteria, so it makes sense to me. The second, the second are the complete blood cells uh, together uh, with the serum IgG, IgG, yeah, 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 IgM. This makes sense. Uh, as a, an investigation ah, of uh, uh, of uh, primary or secondary uh, a, ver a very a very broad screening for primary and secondary immunodeficiency, uh, then uh, um, the ABPA testing actually. I think I think someone is talking. Please mute your microphone. Could you please mute your microphone? No, me has entendido que tienes que añadir. Un artículo de revisión cuando presentes. Mr. Bach. Very good. Thank you so much. Then ABPA. ABPA, uh, 52%, Matia. Yeah. You know what? Uh, that's interesting because uh, uh, in um, because the prevalence of ABPA might, uh, be, might change uh, according to different uh, latitude, right? So one out of two people in the in the web call uh, might think that ABPA in that specific case uh, might be a reason of uh, of the uh, etiology. So there might be some uh, some uh, some clues. 
and then auto antibodies uh, 43 percent uh, um, uh, it's uh, another interesting data so please Mattia can you can you um, contextualize this into the into the case Yes, uh, let's, let's talk about uh, what the guidelines suggest. So uh, ERS guidelines uh, recommend to perform a minimum bundle of etiological tests in every patient with uh, diagnosis of bronchiectasis, including differential blood count, serum immunoglobulins, IgG, IgA, and IgM, and tests for ABPA. But they, they say that uh, additional tests may be required uh, in response to specific clinical features. So this is something we should take into consideration. Uh, the BTS guidelines are actually on the same um, on, on the same wave because they say that uh, uh, full blood count cells, uh, serum total IgE and specific IgE for us for ABPA and uh, IgG, IgA and IgM should be performed in every patient. So this uh, this is the minimum bundle uh, that both the guidelines recommend, and probably this is the right answer for uh, overall this, these questions. Uh, but we should we should uh, think about two different aspects here. The first one is that bronchiectasis is a, a really heterogeneous disease uh, from different points of view, uh, but especially uh, from the uh, etiological uh, diagnosis, because if you consider the different countries being part of the Embark database here, uh, you can see a really heterogeneous uh, proportion of different etiologies uh, for every patient. So, uh, for example, uh, the post-infective bronchiectasis that are the black column here really varies a lot across countries. Uh, and you can say probably the same with TB or COPD or PCD or even idiopathic bronchiectasis. So this is the first aspect that we should try to, to consider. The second one is that uh, the that is especially important in the primary care, uh, the diagnostic delay is something that you would like to avoid to improve the quality of care of your patient. Because if a patient gets a, a incorrect diagnosis, uh, it can go through this phase highlighted here with uh, uh, initiation of a treatment then then fails uh, and then the, the symptom persistence and the patient gets another uh, diagnosis like asthma or bronchitis or COPD. Uh, and then uh, he begins another treatment that fails once more. And uh, so a lot of time passes here uh, until the patient gets uh, referred to an expert center and gets a correct diagnosis with a proper management uh, of, its, of his disease. And in this, in this amount of time, we can have lots of complications like uh, development of uh, chronic bacterial infection or functional uh, deterioration or uh, exacerbation. So this is something that we would like to avoid with a prompt referral to an expert center in case of suspect of a bronchiectasis uh, as a, as a uh, chronic respiratory disease. So uh, we have found a core of tests that should be performed uh, in every clinical setting in which you're working. Uh, these are this one at the bottom here, uh, that are the minimum bundle suggested by guidelines together with a single spirometry uh, as a functional evaluation and a, a chest HRCT scan that is, always, uh, that is also mandatory for the diagnosis of the disease. Uh, but we know that uh, we should look at several other features that can guide us in the etiological workup. So I will try to uh, draw them all uh, before the next clinical cases. Uh, I will try to address uh, the past medical history that can be important in some patients because can give us some advice on uh, what thing we should focus on. Uh, comorbidities is another aspect alongside with clinical phenotypes that is really important um, lab values and microbiological values can be important as well. And then a functional and morphological evaluation through the radiology uh, can, have, can have some, some weight in the evaluation of the etiological workup. Uh, we'll go through this with the clinical case number three. That is a clinical case evaluated in a general respiratory clinic uh, we're talking about a 54 years old woman that works as a nurse in the NHS. Uh, she's a former smoker uh, that uh, has a diagnosis of COPD since five years ago, and it's actually uh, at the moment on treatment with uh, LABA, LAMA, and ICS. Uh, she reported to have a chronic rhinosinusitis and a history of congenital heart disease, 
Uh, and uh, she suffers from daily cough, daily sputum production, and intermittent breathlessness with three exacerbations in the last year treated with uh, systemic corticosteroids and antibiotics. So the patient reports to have really thick mucus, and she has some difficulty to expectorate this. Uh, the sputum culture uh, turned out to be positive for Haemophilus influenzae four months ago, but then she has performed the two other cultures that are negative, uh, and she defines her own exacerbation as uh, being associated with uh, worsening in dyspnea with chest pain and changing the sputum color and consistency. Uh, the uh, spirometric, the pulmonary function test show us a, a reduced uh, FEV1 with a FEV1 uh, FVC ratio of 62 uh, and a uh, value after bronchodilatation that raise up to two liters. Uh, a nasal nitric oxide that is a screening test for PCD uh, turned out to be negative. Uh, and the patient, these are the exams of the patient. You can see hemoglobin 44, uh, 14, uh, what blood cell of 6,500 eosinophils, 283,000 platelets, normal renal function, normal electrolytes, and normal lymph function. So this is the CT scan of the patient. I let you show. Uh, I'll show you this without commenting. We'll come to this in a in a second. I'll let you see this once more. Okay. And so the question I got for you all is, what would be the most probable etiological diagnosis that you would consider in a case like this? Uh, you can only choose one. We've got different options here. Uh, common variable immunodeficiency is the first. Cystic fibrosis, ABPA, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Then NTM pulmonary disease and connective tissue disease are the other options. Please make your votes and don't be shy. So while people are voting, um, and Mattia and Stefano, could we relate to a question by Dr. Uh, Mosgrove, uh, wanting to, you know, um, guide the uh, primary physicians who to uh, refer to a, a, a high-resolution CT scan, given that it's not uh, um, automatically and you wouldn't um, refer every patient. So what do you think? In the, Which, in the suspicion of bronchiectasis, as is Michal, right? This yes, is the question. Yes, yes, I, yes. I, I think I, that's what she meant. Yeah, I would suggest uh, to refer uh, to the uh, to the UK guidelines uh, uh, for uh, GP, uh, where there are there is a very nice list uh, of clinical sign and symptoms uh, of people uh, that might uh, have bronchiectasis and should undergo high resolution CT scan. Uh, mainly people uh, with uh, uh, daily uh, productive uh, sputum, uh, people with um, frequent exacerbations, people uh, with an isolation of uh, pathogens uh, in the sputum, um, and uh, uh, some, some other clinical features. These uh, are patients uh, that might deserve uh, undergo uh, a a chest CT scan because the chance that they might have bronchiectasis uh, uh, is high. Uh, those guidelines for GP uh, are very well done, and I would uh, uh, suggest to uh, to follow those guidelines. Okay, we can probably close the poll here. Okay, we got the results. Can you see this? Yes. So uh, we have uh, uh, ABPA. Uh, as the most probable diagnosis, followed by uh, NTMPD. Uh, and then uh, some of you uh, suggested common variable immunodeficiency. So there are some clinical features and radiological features that uh, are consistent with both a ABPA and NTM in the clinical case. And I think there might be some, some clinical feature about common variable immunodeficiency, Mattia, right? Yeah. Uh, makes sense to me. Can you, can you show us uh, those features? Yes, let's go through the clinical case once more, uh, trying to analyze the thing that can make us think about uh, a certain etiology. So uh, the first one is that the patient has been treated with uh, systemic corticosteroids and she had benefit from this therapy with the last exacerbation. So this is an element uh, altogether with antibiotics, to be honest. Uh, but then the patient reported to have really thick mucus, really difficult to expectorate, there is a, fish, a clinical phenotype that can be, can be important in this case. 
And then the patient reported to have wheeze when she has the exacerbation and the spirometry that she had performed to show us uh, some obstruction with uh, uh, an improvement after bronchodilatation that is significant. That is something we can consider. And then the patient had raised the eosinophils here uh, with 500 uh, total eosinophils that are pretty high. And looking at the CT scan once more that I've not commented before, we can see different features here. The first one is this stinged ring shadow that is actually a sign of bronchiectasis. You can see the dilated airways uh, uh, side by side with uh, the vessel. And moving a little bit to the bottom, we can see something really interesting here. Uh, that is this sign, that is the parallel tram lines that shows us a non-tapering of the bronchi. Uh, that is usually a good sign of the central bronchiectasis. And here you can see some tree in bud pattern that show us that is the radiological uh, correspective of uh, uh, mucus in the distal airways that show us some mm, inflammation in the distal airways. And here, this is the, probably the most important radiological sign. You can see mucus plugging in a really dilated airways. Uh, this is a important sign for the etiology that we want to, to look at. So uh, there are several features, none of them is specific of a given etiology, uh, but when we try to build them all together, we can probably get the answer. Uh, but let's go to uh, the, the, clinical, the clinical features that have guided us in this workshop. In this work, in this workup, we can see that we got some past medical history elements, some clinical phenotypes like this putum, some lab values, some function like this poetry, biological findings that can be important. Uh, so um, the patient was screened with the minimum bundle recommended by guidelines, and you can see here that uh, we got raised eosinophils raise total IgE and both IgE and IgG directed against Aspergillus fumigatus, they were positive. So in this case, when you perform all these tests, the diagnosis comes pretty easy and it is ABPA. ABPA uh, is an allergic reaction to spores of Aspergillus fumigatus uh, that can cause bronchiectasis. There are lots of uh, criteria used in the literature for the diagnosis of a BPA. This is uh, the, the one I reported here are the criteria by the Isham working group uh, that require at least one uh, predisposing condition. In this case, the patient probably had some uh, undiagnosed bronchial asthma as I was showing by the clinical features and the spirometry of the patient. And then the patient had uh, both the obligatory criteria that are uh, total IgE levels that were raised uh, and specific IgE levels against Aspergillus fumigatus. And then all of three, the other criteria, supporting criteria uh, that uh, were present in this patient. So the IgG antibodies against Aspergillus fumigatus, uh, the radiographic changes compatible with ABPA and uh, the raised eosinophils uh, above 500 uh, in, the, in this case. So ABPA is a common etiology of bronchiectasis, especially in, in certain countries like the UK, uh, but most importantly, it's a treatable etiology of bronchiectasis. So it's something that we should consider because managing a patient with ABPA with uh, systemic corticosteroids, or in some cases uh, in combination with uh, uh, antifungal therapy can actually improve the condition of patients and in some cases even reduce uh, the extension of bronchiectasis. So let's make things a little bit more complicated with clinical case number four. Uh, it's another patient evaluated in the general respiratory clinic. We're talking about a 72 years old woman, uh, a former teacher now retired that it was a previous mild smoker uh, and uh, had a father with TB and their mother had bronchiectasis as well. No children, uh, no children here. Uh, and a past medical history, including uh, breast cancer treated with uh, surgery in 2012, then a relapse in 2014 treated with another surgical operation uh, and hormonal therapy. But by now the disease seems to be under control. Uh, she had pneumonia when she was 32 years old and she has chronic rhinosinusitis and depression and anxiety. So uh, she has been diagnosed with COPD and bronchiectasis since uh, 1985. And she, at the moment, is on treatment with uh, lab ICS, LAMA, long-term oxygen therapy, PPI, and vitamin D. Uh, she has a BMI of 20, and uh, she suffers from daily sputum, 40 ml day, marrow scale of four, 
uh, a severe functional impairment with a, a FEV1 of 35, a POPs of 36, and three exacerbations in the last year, two of which required hospitalization, and a chronic infection by Pseudomonas cirrhoginosa. So this is her CT scan. You can see this. So you can probably already see some dilated airways in both lungs, in the upper lobes. You can see some bronchial wall thickness and some mucus plug. But we're not yet. The middle lobe it seems to be the most interesting here with uh, varicoid bronchiectasis, probably even cystic. Uh, and then we got some other bronchial wall thickness here. Some peripheral changes that can be compatible with the with the three bud. Yeah, it looks like a really severe disease from the radio, at least from the radiological perspective. Uh, there's a lingula in, uh, an involvement of the lingula here as well. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so we got a really severe disease in terms of exacerbation, in terms of uh, functional impairment, and in terms of radiology. And the patient goes through the minimum bundle, uh, but we can see that we cannot find uh, any significant alterations. So the complete blood cell count is actually fine. Uh, the eosinophils are not so raised. So 139 is probably not so raised value. IgG, IgA, and IgM are within the normal range, and the IgE, uh, the total IgE uh, is negative, as well as the IgE and IgG directed against Aspergillus fumigatus. So in this case, the question will be, what would you do for this patient? Uh, we, we got different options here. Uh, there's the possibility to test the autoantibodies uh, together with the nasal nitric oxide and serum alpha-1 antitrypsin, or you can go with sweat test, lymphocyte subpopulation, and IgG subclasses, or you can go with both of the previous, uh, the previous options. You could choose to refer the patient to a third level bronchiectasis center, or you could give up on a serological workup and start azithromycin 500 milligrams three times a week and inhaled antibiotics. So please make your vote. I think this, is, this can be tricky, but we can discuss about this. Okay. So, Professor Alberti, what's your opinion here? Well, um, actually, going through the case, Mattia, um, I think that might be a justification uh, for several of those tests. Uh, there might be also a justification uh, for um, asking. Uh, um, to seek some help uh, from uh, from an expert a colleague, um, but I would uh, I would wait for the results uh, of the pool and what our colleagues uh, think about that. Okay, let's see. Maybe we can close the poll and see the results. Okay, so the majority of us uh, will uh, will go for A and B, so all the tests. Uh, and then, or either uh, they will refer to the nearest third level uh, bronchiectasis center. So this makes sense to me, Mattia. Um, yeah. I would not start, to be honest, uh, um, immediately a, a treatment uh, because uh, I think that the chance I might be identified some interesting uh, uh, etiologies in, uh, in these patients uh, are there. Although I recognize the severity of the disease, um, I would also be sure that the patient has a good respiratory physiotherapy uh, done uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a daily therapy. Um, and before thinking of uh, about uh, azithromycin or in an antibiotic, but I think I would go for A and B and uh, closely follow up the patient because it's a severe patient. This would be my, my personal opinion. Yeah, I can say I can say I agree with you. Um... Let's go through the different options and let's see pro and cons of every one of them. So this is the one that I would discard the first because 
probably the treatment. Uh, so azithromycin and inhaled antibiotics are not something that you want to combine in your average patients. Uh, you can probably start one, but probably you could address some more etiological workup before starting treatment. And the physiotherapy uh, is a lot important as well. So it's something that I would avoid for the moment. Um, on the other end, the referral to the uh, nearest third level bronchiectasis center is something that I would consider, uh, especially it depends on the setting in which you're working. So if you don't have the possibility to um, perform a multidisciplinary discussion of the case and to refer the patient and to make certain exams, probably something that you can consider is not, it's not a wrong answer. Um, regarding the test, uh, I can say that uh, there were some, some clues uh, for uh, performing autoantibodies evaluation, nitric oxide, meaning uh, PCD uh, or alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, assessment, or together with this wet test, the lymphocytes of population and the IgG subclasses. Uh, and if we go through the case, to the clinical case once more, we can see different elements that can make us think of uh, certain etiologies. For example, the familiarity with, for bronchiectasis is something that might, might uh, make, uh, make us think uh, about the possibility of a genetic alteration that can cause bronchiectasis. Uh, the absence of children is not a specific one, but it can be due to infertility. And so we can think about certain disease like uh, um, CFTR related disease, uh, a CFTR dysfunction is something that you can consider here. Uh, and on the other end, we got a pneumonia when she was very young. So things are pretty complicated because this one is probably something uh, that goes well with an immunodeficit. So um, it, it's complicated. Uh, the chronic rhinosinusitis goes well with uh, CFTR dysfunction and with PCD as well. And if we move with, if we move here, we can see a really severe uh, functional decline that goes well with alpha one antitrypsin deficiency. So we got. Lots of stuff, even the pseudomonas aeruginosa is something that uh, might, uh, might miss, uh, make us think about certain etiologies. But yeah, uh, there are there were lots of options here. So we decided to go uh, through both of these options and perform lots of different tests for these patients. Uh, and the, we can see here that the autoantibodies turned out to be negative. Uh, the serum alpha-1 antitrypsin was actually Pretty normal. Uh, the sweat test was negative. The nitric oxide, the nasal nitric oxide was negative, but the lymphocyte subpopulation and the IgG subclasses showed us a reduction in B lymphocytes and a reduction in IgG2. So in this case, we can probably make a diagnosis of, of an immunodeficit. Uh, that is something that is potentially treatable. So a referral to um, clinical immunologist is something that we want to consider here because we got a, a really severe disease with lots of exacerbation. The patient is not feeling well. And most importantly, in some cases, uh, an immuno, uh, an, a supplementation of immunoglobulin is something that can improve the condition of these patients. So this is something that we might reflect on. Um, so coming back to our scheme, we can say that there are some tests, uh, some second level tests that we can consider in the general respiratory clinic and in the dedicated bronchiectasis program uh, that are uh, that should be tailored on the characteristic of the patient, but, but it include like sputum culture for mycobacteria, sweat test, evaluation of alpha anti antitrypsin in blood, nasal nitric oxide, nasopharyngoscopy and facial CT scan for chronic rhinosinusitis and autoantibodies. So these are tests that we should not perform in every patient, but if we got several features that can um, make us think of a certain etiology, we can try to, we can try to perform. So, Matthew, can I uh, stop you there because we have some comments and uh, someone wanting to um, ask a question. So, we have a comment from uh, uh, Peter Middleton saying that sweat tests are not just uh, negative, positive, not just above or below 60, but the gray zone is important as well. And um, um, a question about uh, replacing immunoglobulins with a single subclass deficiency so would um and and another one about uh, uh low igg2 so can you comment about a uh, single subclass deficiency yes um well uh the uh if if the sweat test is less than 30 uh usually um that's that's a uh, the we, we don't go further uh 
uh, the diagnosis of CF is not there. If the sweat test is above 60, then uh, the diagnosis of CR uh, of uh, the diagnosis of CF, uh, we follow guidelines. Uh, so uh, we also do genetics and stuff like that. Uh, in between 30 and 60, uh, we repeat the sweat test, especially if it's uh, 35, 32 or something like that. But there might be also uh, the chance that in uh, uh, CF centers or those who are dealing with this disease, we might want to uh, look for a second level genetic analysis. Uh, the rule of uh, heterozygosis of CFTR in people with known CF bronchiectasis is not well, very well elucidated. Uh, we know that there is a prevalent population of non CF bronchiectasis with heterozygosis of the CFTR, uh, but uh, um, the uh, but the, uh, the 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 power of the protein and uh, interventions like modulator or potentiator in this population uh, um, is not uh, uh, supported by already published solid evidence. Great, uh, extremely important field of uh, of research. Uh, and also for new intervention, uh, but uh, uh, we should be adherent to guidelines. Immunoglobulins, um, the supplementation uh, for uh, with uh, Ig uh, endovenous Ig usually uh, is made together uh, with uh, with a clinical immunologist uh, that can perform a secondary uh, kind of test, um, and uh, uh, there might be an impact on clinical outcomes like exacerbations. If the patient is still exacerbating, is still severe, patient with a poor quality of life, uh, although respiratory physiotherapy and medical therapy are optimized. Uh, so uh, we would discuss this with our clinical immunologists, to be honest, uh, as well as the rule of IgG2. Yeah. Uh the uh, importance of uh, nasal NO, and I think we have um, uh, a session dedicated to uh, the diagnostics of PCD, which may be quite uh, uh, complicated. So, um, so uh, uh, maybe just go on with the uh, uh, presentation. Okay. Yes. So we'll go through clinical case number five. There is a, a case evaluated in the dedicated bronchiectasis program, and you can you can probably think that things get co more complicated here. Uh, so we're talking about a 62 years old female uh, that has worked as a clerk, but now is on retirement. Uh, no smoker, no children. Her, her mother died from cirrhosis at 60, and her father from pneumonia at 62. She has a past medical history, including uh, chronic rhinosinusitis, a previous pneumonia in uh, 1998, and a pancreatitis in 2002, and a previous breast cancer treated with surgery in 1995. Uh, the follow-up turned out to be negative. So she has daily sputum. Uh, she has no cough, but she has had five exacerbations in the last year, two of which required hospitalization. And she has a chronic MRSA infection uh, being underweight. Uh, the FEV1 is 57% and the FEV1 uh, FVC ratio is uh, 75%. So this is the CT scan. You can see some bronchial wall thickness, mucus plugging, and uh, lots of bronchiectasis involving the middle lobe, uh, primarily, but even the upper lobes. Uh, and uh, it looks like a really radiological, uh, radiologically significant bronchiectasis here. And here we go. The minimum bundle uh, has been performed for this patient. And we noticed that uh, IgG, uh, lowered IgG, 290 uh, milligram per deciliter. Uh, so according to this, we decided to perform, uh, like in the previous case, uh, lymphocytes of population assessment that was normal and uh, IgG um, uh, classes uh, uh, analysis that showed us a reduction in IgG2 and IgG4. The question here is a little bit more, is a little bit different from the previous one. So we're talking, we're asking, what would you do in this case with only one choice allowed? Uh, would you prescribe azithromycin 500 milligrams three times a week? Would you refer the patient to an immunologist? Would you continue the etiological workup? 
or would you do two of the previous one, like uh, azithromycin plus immunologist or immunologist plus the etiological, continued etiological workup? So please make your vote. Okay. Professor Alberti, what do you think about this case? Well, pretty, <laughs> pretty complex uh, as the as the previous one. Uh, I have a, I have a, um, an idea about that, but I don't want to. Uh, I, I want to the, the, the poll to be closed. Um, the radiological imaging uh, it's very very uh, interesting, but also um, I was able to um, I was able to identify some some features in the in the clinical case before. Okay, let's see if everybody's bold, we can probably close the poll. Let's see what, what people think here. B and C, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we, we have done the same, <laughs> to be honest. Yes, okay. makes sense to me, yes. Uh, so in this case, we have, this, we have, we have noticed that uh, there was uh, a reduction in IgG2 and IgG4. But we have performed uh, evaluation of serum alpha-1 antitrypsin that was low, uh, and the second level genetic assessment showed us a PZZ genotype, uh, and the sweat test uh, was actually borderline with a second level CFTR genetic analysis showing us a deletion uh, F508. Um, of the of the of the patient, uh, so uh, this is just what we expect from this patient. We could expect uh, to have a uh, um, IgG uh, deficiency on top of the iceberg, something that you can notice with uh, just your uh, your standard standard minimum bundle test with the IgG subclasses uh, analysis. But the patient here had another disease that was underlying. There was another. Uh, there was a genetic condition, alpha one antitrypsin deficiency and at probably some sort of lack of activity of the CFTR that can possibly be responsible of the disease in a, in a proportion of the pathogenetic effect. So in this case, we got two different etiology and a probable, a likely contribute from a third component that was underlying. Um, yeah, the impact of genetic disease in bronchiectasis can be really important because they, we can have uh, multi-systemic involvement uh, the management of patients in a dedicated setting is something that patients want if, you, if they got a genetic condition. And uh, a genetic counseling can be important in patients with a genetic uh, alteration, uh, especially in the, uh, in the context of uh, people that uh, have child and want to know what are the possibility to transmit uh, the disease to their children. And social issues can be raised here. Uh, this is just um, uh, something that you would like to remember about the specific features of, uh, um, of uh, people that have some uh, genetic def some genetic disease that are correlated with bronchiectasis, like DCFTR that usually has some upper lobe predominance with chronic pseudomonas serogenosa or MRSA infection uh, and systemic manifestation, including pancreatitis and infertility. Uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency has some lower lobes predominance, association with emphysema, uh, functional impairment, uh, cirrhosis, panniculitis, and vasculitis. And the PCD, on the other, on the other hand, had some middle lobe and lingual predominance, c 2 inversus in up to 50% of cases, and association with prenatal infection, otitis media, and sinusitis. So to complete this scheme, uh, I think we're running out of time. So to complete this scheme, I would just suggest that uh, there are some tests that can be uh, approached in a given patient uh, in certain moments, including uh, genetics for alpha-1 antitrypsin, CFTR genetics, HIV tests, IgG subclasses, lymphocytes subpopulation, uh, antibody response to pneumococcal vaccination, cilia ultrastructure and motility evaluation, and platysmography with DLCO and BD test. Mattia, do you have a do you have a general slide uh, that can help us uh, to better uh, to better frame uh, the different uh, the different possible uh, uh, etiologies? Um, yep. And the okay, this is good. 
Here we are. Just to, to conclude the presentation, uh, I will go through the different features that can allow us to um, suspect the different etiologies. So uh, the IBPA is usually associated with central bronchiectasis, mucus plug, and a history of asthma. Uh, the immunodeficit is usually characterized by frequent exacerbation and even extra pulmonary infection, uh, mainly by atypical pathogens. The NTM pulmonary disease usually affects women, middle-aged women uh, with a, a primary involvement of the middle lobe uh, and uh, some peculiar radiological features that we have not seen it today, but yeah, they're similar to the BPA-1 in some sort of sense. Uh, the CTD uh, usually has poor prognosis and has got a frequent exacerbation and uh, huge radiological variability. Inflammatory bowel disease is another topic that we have not faced here, uh, but it's usually an aggressive disease. They may even get worse after surgery, and it's usually very responsive to steroids. Um, COPD has usually got poor prognosis, and the three genetic defects um, have, have got the features that we have already seen uh, in the previous slide. So to conclude this presentation, I would say that there are some, these are the take home messages. Uh, I would like to uh, give you the idea that the minimum bundle is something that you should perform in every patient. That additional features, that are the ones that we have uh, seen before, uh, is something that you should, should do in your workup and should guide us in your workup. Uh, that the extension of the workup can detect uh, some potentially treatable etiologies like immunodeficits and uh, ABPA. That multiple etiologies can coexist in the same patient, and most importantly, that the multidisciplinary management is the key to successfully manage this pathology, this uh, disease. So thank you all for, for, your, uh, for being here, for your attention. Thank you, Mattia. Thank you. Uh, Michal? Yeah, these are really some very, very interesting cases, and I think um, the uh, most important um, aspect is that you need to tailor according to the clinical features and uh, the minimal bundle is, is indeed very minimal. So before, I, I want to thank you both again, Stefano and uh, Matia and the um, audience for being so um, interactive and asking a lot uh -huh. of questions. I'm sorry we didn't have time to go through all of the questions. Um, before we leave, I want to um, uh, remind of the uh, GP crash course that will take place in the um, uh, on uh, on this month on Saturday, February twenty uh, fifth. Uh, it's uh, um, uh, virtual and uh, uh, very very uh, um, very uh, a good resource for uh, GPs um, uh, to uh, learn more about uh, bronchiectasis. And the next uh, session in this uh, webinar series is uh, about uh, treating uh, exacerbations of bronchiectasis. It will be in um, um, April 19th. Of course, we will advertise it. And um, thank you all uh, uh, very much once again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And if you have uh, some uh, follow-up questions, uh, please feel free to write an email to both of us and we will try to answer today. Thank you, Michal. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.